Good morning. Good afternoon. Well, it's uh, 10 a.m. here in California. This is Jeremy Martin, Vice President for Energy and Sustainability at the Institute of the Americas, and we're very pleased to be coming to you again today with the latest installment of our webinar series on critical minerals and the energy transition, co-hosted with our colleagues and friends at the Payne Institute for Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines. And uh, I'll throw it over to Morgan Bazilian here in a minute to make a couple of remarks. But let me just quickly, for anyone who, on the off chance you have not joined us before, um, either for this webinar series or overall for one of our webinars, we uh, we do things, uh, we think, fairly simply in terms of how we run uh, the, the presentation and then the discussion, and we'll use the chat function. So uh, when, uh, when our presenter, Dr. Nassa, finishes remarks, uh, we'll turn to question and answer session and uh, like I said for those of you who joined us before you know that the, the chat function in, in, in is where we would ask you pose your questions and again just a reminder you don't have to wait until the end of the formal presentation to pose your questions feel free at any point during the course of his remarks to jump in make a comment and uh, I know this crowd uh, judging by the first three editions of the critical minerals webinar series this crowd does not hold back on the chat function and in fact uh, we always are are tickled by the uh, the dynamic inter interchange and exchange of information that you all get into. So uh, don't don't feel uh, please don't feel shy today. Go for it. Um, so let me just quickly uh, uh, throw it over to Morgan Bazilian before I formally introduce our speaker, and I'll just let Morgan again welcome as part of this webinar series. Morgan, thanks again for your support. It's a pleasure to do this together with you all. Uh, absolutely, Jeremy. We we really appreciate the partnership and the collaboration during these uh, tough times. Um, my name is Morgan Bazilian. I'm the director of the Payne Institute at the Colorado School of Mines. And I'm especially uh, uh, thrilled that uh, Nadal Nassar uh, has joined us today. I think he is one of the foremost uh, experts in the world on this topic. And so we have a real treat uh, and, and are honored by uh, him joining us. So thanks, thanks again, Nadal. And, and also, Jeremy, to you and the team at, at the Institute of the Americas. This has proved to be a great partnership for us. And uh, enjoy the presentation. And uh, we, we look forward to, this is the fourth edition. We don't have any more formally scheduled, but we'll get on that shortly and, and, uh, and be sure to let everyone know. So uh, as Morgan said, we're, we're particularly pleased to, to have the latest installment. Um, and we've talked a lot about the U.S. Geological Survey <clears throat> excuse me, in um, the previous webinars, they've been referenced a lot, a lot of commentary. Uh, I think particularly in terms of some of the lessons learned and when we talked somewhat about the, the State Department-led Energy Resource Governance Initiative, some of the, the, the information they leaned on in developing that initiative, obviously the USGS was, was heavily involved. Today, we're gonna dial in and focus specifically on supply chain risks and managing critical mineral supply chain risks. And, and that is indeed where, uh, where Dr. Nadal Nassa has done his his work. He has a PhD from Yale University, and I'm going to read you his title. You see it there on the screen, but just um, just so you know, he's the chief of materials flow analysis section at the National Minerals Information Center at the U.S. Geological Survey, which is just outside D.C. in Reston, Virginia. He has a, a bachelor degrees in chemical engineering, so he's he's not only a geologist, he's an engineer, and he also has masters from Yale, and and uh, he's done an MBA in sustainable global enterprise. So he doesn't just, uh, I would suggest, know the geology. He doesn't just know the critical mineral side of this, but he knows, I would suggest, the entire uh, enterprise and the supply chain, really from a, a, a whole uh, holistic approach in terms of business, minerals, and where we are in energy transition. So uh, the final point I'd make is we've talked a lot and had a lot of exchange in the chat about the supply chain risks. And I think those are ever more uh, at the forefront of our discussions these days with everything that's gone on and, and the COVID-19 crisis, but also some of what Jesse Edmondson talked about with uh, the way China has positioned itself and some of what's happened um, in that regard. So without any further ado, let me let me throw the mic, throw the, the it over to Dr. Nadal Nassar to offer his formal presentation, and then we'll come back and have the question and answer session. So, uh, Nadal, thanks again, live from Reston, Virginia. Over to you, please. Great. Good morning, everybody. 
Uh, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me well, Jeremy? So uh, thank you, Jeremy and Morgan, for that kind introduction and for this opportunity to talk to you today about uh, the work that we're doing at the National Minerals Information Center. Um, I'm trying to get my presentation up. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to be able to share my screen here. It was working a little bit ago, and now it doesn't seem like it's an option. Let me see if I can uh, try to make it work. OK, there we go. All right, I think uh, it should be on now. Sounds good, OK. So uh, just very briefly about our center, uh, for those that don't know us, uh, we are the primary source of information for the US government on mineral commodity uh, supply and demand uh, for some 90 plus mineral non-fuel mineral commodities. Uh, we've been around for uh, over 100 years now as a center in one form or another. Uh, and perhaps we're most well known for our annual statistical publications, the mineral commodity summaries that comes out typically at the end of January every year and the minerals yearbooks. Uh, the section that I lead, the material flow analysis section, tries to take all of that information that's produced by our center and tries to make sense of it, um, looking down the supply chain all the way from mining and processing through manufacturing use and end of life to try to understand really what's going on here, where are the problems, what might happen in the future. Okay, so for those of us that are interested in the energy sector, you might be wondering, you know, why in, in general and specifically about the energy transition in particular, you know, why should we even care about non-fuel mineral commodities? Um, and I think it's generally not well understood by the, the public how reliant the energy sector is on mineral commodities, uh, including, you know, everything from uh, traditional oil and gas, for example. In oil drilling, you use barite for, as a drilling mud. In reforming, uh, in, in petroleum reforming, you use platinum and rhenium uh, as catalysts. Uh, to get the high octane gasoline. You also use lanthanum and to a lesser degree, cerium in fluid catalytic cracking. Um, in, in gas turbines, for example, uh, you would use uh, single crystal turbine blades that uh, have, as you can see, a number of alloying uh, elements that are uh, allow for these engines to uh, operate at higher temperatures, um, makes them much more efficient, so these ultra-efficient uh, gas turbines. Uh, of course, in renewable energy, whether it's thin film, they use a number of different metals in the absorber layer, uh, offshore wind, uh, direct drive that have those uh, rare earth permanent magnets. And of course, it, the, the topic that everybody's been talking about over the last couple of years, the electrical vehicles and uh, energy storage with the lithium ion batteries. Here showing uh, the one with the NMC configuration with nickel, cobalt, and manganese. So a lot of different uh, commodities, these are just representative. It's by no means a comprehensive overview. You can imagine even uh, lighting with LEDs using rare earths, for example, or even air conditioners that use permanent magnets. So everything from production, uh, generation, uh, transmission, and use of electricity and energy requires these non-fuel mineral commodities. So if we look specifically at energy generation, uh, these are projections by the US Energy Information Agency up to 2050 and their latest uh, outlook report. So by different uh, sources of technology for uh, world electricity generation capacity. Uh, and you can see here, you know, coal is expected to generally stay about the same. Uh, nuclear also about the same. Other renewables, which includes both hydroelectric and germ uh, geothermal as well as biofuels leveling off. Uh, but if you look at wind, solar, and other fossil fuels, which is mainly natural gas, those are expected to, to really increase rapidly over the next couple of decades, um, especially for solar. If you look at that, it's expected to be the number one single source of technology, uh, world electricity capacity generation by 2050, almost uh, four terawatts of installed capacity there. Looking specifically at the United States uh, for, for solar PV, uh, this uh, graph is showing, uh, this map is showing the location of different solar PV installations in the United States by size and the year that they were installed, but also by the technology. Uh, so obviously crystalline silicon is, is the most dominant type of, of solar PV panels out there. Uh, in the United States, uh, there are several thin films, commercial thin films uh, that, are, that are also used. The most important of which are which, the one that has the largest share in the thin film markets is the CAD tail, the cadmium telluride. Um, 
so why am I why am I talking to you about uh, these different uh, technologies? Well, I think uh, many of you probably know this is that a lot of these different solar PV technologies require different uh, mineral commodities uh, that are typically referred to as minor metals, right? And they're minor metals, but also they're byproducts. So uh, for CAD TEL, for example, you get you need uh, cadmium and tellurium. Both are byproducts. So uh, tellurium is a byproduct of copper and cadmium is a byproduct of zinc. Um, same for all these other elements that are shown on the screen, indium, gallium, uh, selenium, silver, germanium, are all byproducts that are produced um, during the recovery of, of other metals. And so that, that provides a little bit of complexity in terms of how their supply might respond, um, given that they provide very little revenue to, to the processors, to the miners and the refiners. They, they typically are not, um, uh, they might not be recovered simply because it's they might be a nuisance or they might not uh, have substantial revenue associated with them. And so they their supply is, is significantly more complex. Uh, one thing that we're currently looking at, uh, sticking with the cad tell example, uh, currently uh, some research that we're doing today is trying to understand, okay, well, if, if cad tell demand is going to increase, well, how much more tellurium could be recovered that currently isn't recovered from the copper anode slimes and the copper refiners. So that's some of the work that we're, that we're looking at. But of course, it's not restricted ju to just um, solar PV technologies. If you look across the periodic table, you see a lot of the elements that, that we're interested in are produced mainly or only as byproducts. So this periodic table is showing uh, the percentage of each element's primary production that is obtained as a byproduct. And you can see a lot of those that we talked about already, uh, gallium, germanium, indium, tellurium, selenium are only produced um, as, as a byproduct. So 100% of their primary production is as a byproduct. Um, as you see, there's a lot of red in this, this figure suggesting that a lot of the technologies that, or a lot of the elements that are, that are used in modern technology uh, has this complexity of, of being uh, uh, only produced as, as byproducts. An added complexity that I think is, uh, is also really important to point out is the fact that a lot of these mineral commodities are only produced in a few countries, right? So South Africa produces most of the platinum group metals. Uh, they also have chromium, manganese, uh, vanadium. So in these periodic table figures, what's shown here is the percentage of each elements, again, uh, global production uh, for, from each country. Um, other countries like Chile, you know, they have a significant uh, supply, or they provide a significant share of the world's rhenium, molybdenum, copper, uh, iodine, lithium as well. Uh, countries like Brazil, they dominate the, the niobium supply. Uh, other countries like Canada, Australia, and Russia have a, a smattering of a lot of different elements that they provide a considerable portion of to the world market. Uh, with the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you know, they're dominant, of course, in, in cobalt and tantalum. And then you have China, which pretty much has everything else, right? So they are major producers for most of the other commodities uh, across the periodic table. So if you look at it over time, so that was a snapshot in time. I think the date for that previous slide was 2014 or 2015. But if you look at it over time, what you can see is that uh, China's increasing share of global production uh, is relatively new phenomena. What's shown here in, here in this periodic table is over the last, uh, you know, decade or so from 1996 to 2015, what is China's share of global primary production for each element? Uh, so you can see for some commodities, China has been the dominant player for a long time, uh, including the lanthanides and yttrium, so the rare earths, uh, tungsten and antimony. But, uh, but some of the commodities, they've only recently become uh, a major producer. This includes magnesium metal, uh, silicon, uh, gallium, uh, cobalt refining. So you can see the point of this is to show that it's a relatively new phenomenon that China has been, become such a dominant player in so many different commodities uh, that previously they were not necessarily a major player. For developed countries, including the United States, what this translates to uh, often is a high degree of import reliance. So uh, in our uh, annual publication, the Mineral Commodity Summaries, this is uh, the last one that was um, published earlier this year, uh, we've been publishing uh, the U.S. net import reliance every year. So the percentage of uh, consumption in the United States is from foreign sources on a net basis. So imports minus exports. Um, and we've been tracking it, as I said, for a couple of decades. And what's shown on the figure to the right is the number of commodities for which the United States is at least 
25% uh, net import reliant in, in several different buckets, 25 to 50%, uh, 50 to 99 uh, percent, and then 100% import reliant. And you can see the number of commodities has grown from 21 commodities in 1954 to almost 60 commodities today. So one thing we wanted to look at, um, this is a pub from a publication we did a couple of years ago, was to say, well, we understand that there's uh, import reliance uh, in the case of the United States. Uh, now, China does have a lot of the commodities that they need, but they don't have everything that they need. So we wanted to compare what the US import reliance looked like versus what the Chinese import reliance looked like. And we broke it out into these four quadrants. So things in quadrant one are commodities that uh, both the US and China are relatively self-sufficient, uh, you know, less than 50% net import reliant. They include things like molybdenum, uh, for which both the United States and China are both net exporters. So that's why it's in the bottom left quadrant. In quadrant two are commodities for which the United States is highly import reliant, but China is not. Um, so the example, of course, here that's very well known are the rare earths. But there are other commodities in there as well, including germanium, tellurium, yttrium, uh, uh, gallium, bismuth, and indium, for example. The converse of that uh, occurs in, in quadrant three. These are commodities for which the United States is not necessarily highly import reliant, but China is. Uh, here, you might be surprised to see iron. Uh, iron ore is a major, China is a major producer of iron ore, but they're producing, they're consuming more than they produce or they are a net importer in this case. I think this data is for year 2015. Uh, I neglected to mention the, the color scale here. What's shown is the production concentration using the Herfindahl scale. So the, the warmer the color, the reds and the oranges, the more concentrated production. So the fewer players there are uh, on a country basis. Um, so beryllium here is shown in a warmer color. The U.S. is the largest beryllium producer uh, in the world. Uh, so that's why it's showing up as, as a warm color and why the U.S. Is, is, uh, has low import reliance where China has a high import reliance. Perhaps the most interesting quadrant, of course, is the one in the top right, quadrant four, where both the U.S. and China are net import, uh, highly import reliant. Uh, so this includes uh, the platinum group metals, uh, lithium, titanium, rhenium, tantalum, and in the, in the far right corner, niobium, where I mentioned earlier, Brazil is the dominant producer and both uh, the US and, and China do not have any production. So it's in the, in the very far, far corner. So this gives us an idea of um, you know, where uh, the dependencies might be and potentially where the competition might come in the future uh, in terms of both of these are the large, you know, these are the largest economies in the world. They're, they're major manufacturers, especially China, of course and they need these raw materials uh, for their manufacturing sector. If they don't have them domestically, they're gonna go overseas to be able to, to, to secure their supplies. And if you look at uh, what China's done over the last couple of decades is that they have done that. They've gone overseas and they uh, secured their supply of the raw materials that they don't necessarily have, including cobalt. So this is an example for cobalt where uh, there are Chinese firms in the DRC, Zambia and Papua New Guinea uh, that have secured supplies for uh, for the domestic uh, Chinese market. Uh, but it's not restricted to just cobalt. Uh, it also includes niobium in Brazil and lithium in Australia and Chile as well. So the idea there is that China knows that they don't have these uh, resources geologically. They're going to go overseas and make sure that they're not going to be cut off. and They're going to have these resources that they need uh, to, to grow their economy. So the question that you might be asking, okay, well, that's China, China's response. What is the US doing about it? So in the United States, there is, under the federal government, there is the US National and, uh, Science and Technology Council. Uh, there's a subcommittee uh, on critical and strategic mineral supply chains. So this is run out of the executive office of the president. It's co-chaired by uh, both us at Department of Interior as well as the Department of Energy, but includes members from across the federal government, uh, including the State Department, which I know you've heard from, uh, one of these previous seminars, Department of Defense, Commerce, Department of Homeland Security, uh, EPA, uh, as well as others. There are several functions that this subcommittee has, including developing and applying and periodically updating a methodology for assessing uh, which commodities are, are critical for the United States. So the idea here is that we know that, you know, import reliance is a factor, but it's not the only factor, right? So import reliance is important to look at it. Uh, but by itself is not necessarily a problem. So how can we decide uh, 
which commodities are really at risk uh, of, of a supply disruption and which ones should we really, really care about. So that's, that's what I really want to talk to you about for the rest of this talk, um, and specifically about a new methodology that we just published in the journal Science Advances, the citations there at the bottom. Basically, what we decided to do is uh, use a traditional risk modeling framework. And by that, I mean we define risk. For our case, we're talking about a supply risk, so a risk associated with a supply disruption. And, and the traditional uh, modeling framework suggests that the risk is proportional to uh, the hazard, so the likelihood of a supply disruption, your exposure to it, and your vulnerability. So are you able to withstand the effects of the supply disruption? And the idea there is that all the components are necessary for there to be risk, and each loan is an insufficient condition. So if you think about uh, if there's a high likelihood but you're not exposed to it, uh, then there is no risk, and, and vice versa. And so the trick is, so we got this general framework, how do we actually put some, some numbers around it to quantify it? And so what we decided to do was to do an indicator-based assessment. Um, and I'll just walk, through, uh, walk you through each of those. So for us, uh, the, the hazard is a, is a disruption potential, so the likelihood of a, of a foreign supply disruption. And we decided to measure that based on the concentration of production in countries that may become unable or unwilling to supply to the United States. So again, thinking back to the earlier slide that I showed production concentration in China or elsewhere, that's generally a, a, a not a good thing for, uh, it increases the likelihood of a supply disruption. Simply, it's like the idea of having all of your eggs in one basket, right? Then we modify that by whether or not the countries are, are likely to become unable or unwilling to supply to the United States. For ability, we use the Fraser Institute's annual survey of mining uh, companies. Here, they're taking into factors such as political stability, availability of labor, adequacy of infrastructure, taxation regime, et cetera. And they rank countries, uh, whether how attractive they are in terms of uh, mining and exploration uh, for mineral commodities. And here you can see countries that are in the green are relatively viewed favorably. Countries in the red are viewed less favorably. So here we uh, set them as countries that may become unable to supply the United States in the future. For willingness, we decided to come up with our own indicator. Here we decided that willingness uh, has three factors that we should, we should look at, uh, whether there are strong trade ties uh, with the United States, whether there are shade, shared ideological values. So imagine there's um, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, et cetera, and whether there's military cooperation or not. Again, on the same uh, green to red scale, green being countries that um, are viewed favorably in terms of willingness to supply and, and red are countries that are viewed less favorably in terms of willingness to supply. So we combine all this information to come up with a disruption potential indicator. Our trade exposures is one that I mentioned earlier. It's our net import reliance. Uh, so we do imports minus exports relative to apparent consumption. So we look at how much is being produced domestically, how much we're net importers of relative to our apparent consumption. Uh, and this gives you us a measure for how much of what the U.S. consumes is exposed to foreign supply disruptions. Finally, our third indicator, our economic vulnerability. Here, it's our ability to withstand uh, the effects of a supply disruption. Uh, this is where we spent a lot of our time trying to come up with something that we felt was adequate. Uh, what we decided to do was to measure uh, the annual expenditure on a specific mineral commodity by a specific industry relative to that industry's profitability, right? So the idea here is that if you're an industry that has relatively thin margins, profit margins, then uh, you are less likely to be able to withstand a supply disruption uh, that causes a price spike, for example. Similarly, if you're consuming a lot of the commodity in terms of a lot of expenditure in that commodity, you are also more vulnerable because you have less flexibility. So lower profit margin, or a higher expenditure reduces your ability to cope with the situation where there's a supply disruption or a price spike uh, that, uh, that resulted from a supply disruption. So the way we did it was we took data. Uh, this is an example for platinum. We know the, what platinum is consumed in, in terms of end uses. We tied those into specific NAICS codes, so North American Industry Classification Codes, and we're able to get data from the US Census Bureau from the economic census uh, that with years that end with two and seven, and for all the other years uh, from the annual survey of manufacturers to assess the profitability of each uh, manufacturing industry. 
So for example, uh, we know platinum is used in automotive catalysts that fits under the code for other motor vehicle parts manufacturing. We're able to dig in and to get the profitability of that sector of that industry, excuse me, and look at how much uh, platinum expenditure that industry uh, purchased versus what their, their profits were. So let me give you an example of that um, for, for aluminum in, in more detail. Um, so the equation here, let me just break it down really quick. Uh, it looks more complicated than it is, but basically uh, there are two pieces to it. Uh, one is on the right side, it's looking at expenditures or expenditure on a, commit, on a given commodity in a given year relative. So divided by that industry's operating profits. And then we multiply it by that uh, industry's uh, value add. So it's contribution to GDP relative to GDP. So that's what that left um, part of the equation is. And so what I'm gonna show here on this figure, um, the expenditure to operating profit ratio is only gonna be on the vertical axis and the value add relative to GDP is gonna be on the horizontal axis. And then the overall area is the economic vulnerability indicator. So this is an example for, for aluminum. Again, the, the horizontal is, uh, is the, the vulnerability, uh, the importance, sorry, the value add relative to GDP and the vertical axis is that, that ratio of expenditure to operating profit. So these are the 20 uh, or so industries that, that use aluminum in the United States. So the higher the bar, that means there's higher expenditure and lower operating profit. And the wider the bar, the, the larger the contribution is to US GDP. So I'm just gonna point out two commodities that I've highlighted or two industries that I've highlighted in blue, uh, the passenger cars and light trucks and the metal cans and rigid semi-container uh, food containers. So they both have actually the same area. Uh, so their overall contribution to aluminum's economic vulnerability score is the same, but they obviously have very different shapes. So the metal cans industry has a very uh, tall but narrow uh, bar, suggesting that uh, metal cans are much more uh, vulnerable in terms of, uh, you know, they, they use a lot of aluminum relative to their operating profit, but they make, a, they represent a relatively small sliver of the U.S. economy. Now contrast that to the passenger cars and light trucks. Uh, yes, aluminum is of course important to them, but not as important as it is to metal can manufacturing. But of course, passenger cars has a much wider bar suggesting that it is much larger contributor to US GDP. And so we're able to do that for each industry, some across uh, the industries and come up with a score. So I just wanted to walk you through that little bit of detail there. Okay, so what do the results look like? So these are the results for year 2016. Uh, I'm going to be plotting disruption potential on the horizontal, economic vulnerability on the vertical. And the size of the dot is that trade exposure, so net import reliance relative to apparent consumption. And then the overall shade of the dot, the color, is going to be our overall supply risk. And I'm going to show it uh, based on clusters. Uh, so there are commodities that are in the bottom left. So this includes cadmium, strontium, selenium, mica, tellurium, arsenic. So these are commodities that have relatively low disruption potential, meaning that they are produced in, in many countries that are, that are uh, able and willing to supply to the United States and relatively low to moderate economic vulnerability. So uh, either their, their consumption expenditure is relatively low or their profit, the profitability of the industries that they, that they are in uh, is, is relatively high. Commodities that are in the top left uh, quadrant um, include copper, lead, phosphate, molybdenum, iron ore, and gold. Uh, obviously very important to the US economy, but uh, relatively low disruption potential. You know, a lot of producers of, of, of gold, of course, a lot of producers of copper. Um, also the size of the dot is relatively small, suggesting that the US is either a net exporter, uh, which is the case for the three uh, yet, uh, blue colored dots, um, or near net exporter, uh, such as the case for, for the other three. Contrast that to some of the other commodities in this quadrant, uh, including aluminum, nickel, silver, zinc, uh, platinum, palladium. Uh, here, again, the disruption potential is maybe moderate to low, uh, but very high economic vulnerability. And here we have a higher trade exposure, either full net import reliance or close to it. The reason for aluminum is because we took a bottleneck approach for, its, uh, for each of the stages, but also specifically for the trade exposure. So the United States does not mine a significant amount of bauxite, uh, although they do have uh, alumina uh, refining and aluminum smelting. Uh, 
we took the bottleneck approach to the highest score throughout the supply chain. And that's why we, we have a high trade exposure there due to the lack of, of bauxite production mining. Moving on, uh, there are some commodities that are further on the disruption potential, uh, but again, relatively low trade exposure, uh, helium and beryllium. Uh, the US is, is the major producer of both. Uh, tungsten, uh, we are, uh, the United States is, uh, is, does not produce any primary tungsten, but does produce tungsten from recycling. So there's, there's that going for it. Um, and, and finally, uh, more towards the, uh, to the right are things that uh, probably have heard of in the news, the, the platinum group metals, some of the minor metals that I've mentioned earlier, gallium, uh, graphite, uh, iridium, uh, ruthenium, et cetera. These have uh, moderate to, to low economic vulnerability, but high uh, disruption potential and, and high trade exposure. So you can see a, a general pattern here that uh, commodities generally trend from the top left to the bottom right. I think that's, uh, that's probably correct in terms of commodities that are been used for you know, a millennia, uh, gold, copper, lead, are typically produced in a lot of different countries, uh, relatively low disruption potential, but heavily used in, in, in industry. Commodities that are more niche in their use and their application, uh, typically produced in only a few countries, and, and so they would have a higher supply disruption potential, but not necessarily a, a, a very large economic vulnerability uh, score. So this is a snapshot in time for year 2016, but we've done it for a decade to see how the scores might have moved Throughout, uh, throughout that decade. Uh, so I'm just gonna pick one commodity, lanthanum, uh, one of the light rare earth elements. And, and you can see the score for 2007 and see how it progressed uh, throughout this time. Uh, as, as you all recall, uh, there were uh, threats to cut off supplies uh, that drove the rare earth prices to unprecedented levels. Uh, the higher price of course meant a higher expenditure, uh, which caused economic vulnerability to, to go up. Uh, eventually, prices started to come down, but most of the production was still in China, so relatively uh, very high disruption potential. Eventually, as Linus and other producers outside of, of, of China started to ramp up, uh, there was diversification of supply, so the disruption potential went back down. And by 2016, we're pretty much where we've started. We've made a full loop uh, around going up and, and, and back down to where we started in 2007 or, or 2008 or so. And we're, we're right now crunching the numbers to see what the results look like for two year, 2017 and 2018. I suspect that we've probably started to climb back up this, uh, this cycle and we're going through this again. And, and what I'll talk about in a little bit is you know, the hope to break the cycle so we don't keep going through it. But before we do that, let me just walk you through the, the results overall. Uh, so these are uh, the scores for all the commodities across all the years. Uh, it's a little difficult to see, so let me just zoom into the top uh, 23 or so. Uh, these are rank ordered by the average score across the decade. Uh, the ones that come out on top, uh, no surprises there. Dysprosium, yttrium, neodymium, cobalt, uh, lanthanum, cerium, etc. cetera. Uh, these are the ones that the most people have been talking about and are pretty much on everybody's critical minerals list. Uh, what's also noted in this figure are the leading producers. Um, as you can see, China is of course the leading producer for, for many of these. Uh, South Africa is, is there for, for the platinum group metals, uh, DRC Rwanda for, for tantalum, uh, and DRC for cobalt as well. Uh, a neat thing that this uh, modeling allows us to do is also identify uh, which application contributed the most uh, to the vulnerability score. So for dysprosium, no surprise, it's, it's permanent magnets. The yttrium, it's the advanced ceramics, uh, cobalt. For the United States, for cobalt, it's really the super alloys that are used in those uh, gas turbines or jet engines. Um, there is obviously uh, a lot of use of cobalt uh, globally for lithium ion batteries, uh, but for the United States, the, the major application is in super alloys. So this allows us to see you know, where, are, uh, where are both the vulnerabilities and where are the risks uh, associated with, uh, with the supply of these commodities for the United States manufacturing sector. So once you've identified these risks and identify which commodities are, are, are at highest risk, uh, the question is, of course, okay, what are we going to do about it? Um, and so there, there is a federal strategy out there um, that was put out um, through the National Science Technology uh, Council uh, via the Department of Commerce. Uh, there, uh, there are six calls to action. I'll just walk you through them relatively quickly. Uh, the first one is about research and development. Um, so this is led by Department of Energy. 
and it's really about developing substitute materials and developing recycling technologies. The second one is about uh, defense industrial base, obviously led by the Department of Defense. Uh, you may have seen the calls for information that put out there uh, through several uh, presidential determinations uh, to help secure a uh, rare supply chain. So that falls under this call to action number two. Call to action number three is about international trade and cooperation. It's led by Department of State and Department of Commerce. Uh, the early program that was mentioned uh, at one of the previous webinars uh, falls under this camp. There's obviously a lot of discussion within the State Department with our, with our allies and friends, uh, including, of course, Canada and Australia and others, um, to help uh, bolster this relationship in terms of securing supplies of these uh, critical commodities. Call to action four is, is really where we sit uh, in terms of understanding domestic critical mineral resources. It includes what I just described in terms of identifying the commodities that are most critical to the United States, but also includes a lot of other initiatives. Uh, there's a large initiative within the US Geological Survey called Earth MRI. Uh, it's a mapping initiative looking at enhancing our geological, geophysical, and topographic mapping. Uh, for, for the session that I lead, it also includes developing scenario analysis to try to understand what future supply and demand might look like. It involves looking at the entire supply chain to understand where the losses might be occurring and how potentially we can decrease those and developing more sophisticated modeling techniques. So we're getting uh, deeper and deeper into the economic analysis. And uh, I can give you a hint, you know, a preview right now, we're, we're delving into using more and more of the input output uh, table, the economic input output world and understanding how a supply disruption might get uh, affected or ripple through the rest of the economy uh, once, it, once it occurs. Cost action uh, five is about uh, improving access uh, to federal lands and, and permitting. So that's led by uh, the Bureau of Land Management under Interior, as well as the Department of Agriculture. And finally, call to action number six is about growing the critical minerals workforce, and it's led by Department of uh, Education and NSF. And so you can see with, with these six calls to actions that uh, are currently being implemented, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It covers a lot of different things, everything from research and development to you know, trade and international relations, to geological mapping, to permitting, to, to education and workforce. It's, it's, it's quite comprehensive. And you know, the, the goal right now that's being led by uh, C40 at Office of Science Technology Policy is, is to implement this work with, with all the different federal agencies that are involved. Uh, we have a little bit more time, I think, and so I'm going to walk you through one more specific example um, of, of work that we're doing uh, specifically in our center uh, that, that would fit under Call to Action 4. Uh, this is some work that we did with, in collaboration with the Inter-America Development Bank. Uh, what it is is basically a, a, a geo PDF uh, that provides information regarding the location of mineral production processing facilities, as well as exploration, resources, uh, also oil and gas, transportation infrastructure, electricity generation, oil and gas terminals. Uh, the idea there is that there, we can put a lot of this information uh, geospatially that can help uh, uh, boost uh, development in the region. Uh, we've done this work, it's publicly available. Uh, you can see the, the, the citation at the bottom with the URL. Uh, this information is, is, I think, very helpful to, to countries and, and developers. We're looking to expand it to, to other uh, regions of the world. Uh, so that's something that, that, that we are heavily involved in and we will continue to do. We can also use this information to, to turn it back into the criticality model that I described, the, the risk modeling that I described. And, and this is some work that we published uh, last year where we uh, look specifically at uh, copper production in, in South America. And knowing that they typically occur in areas that are uh, tectonically active, we teamed up with our uh, with members from our natural uh, hazards program to try to understand, you know, what might be the disruption potential from, from earthquakes. So in the model that I described earlier, we're looking at hazard in terms of uh, really, uh, you know, willingness and ability for countries to provide based on, um, you know, human actions. But there are, of course, natural hazards that could affect supply disruptions, including earthquakes, other natural disasters, and of course, as everybody's aware, uh, pandemics such as COVID-19. So this is the work that, that uh, we recently published looking at uh, 
you know, what percent or what's the expected annual disruption due to earthquakes uh, for, for copper specifically? And the results, they vary depending on which vulnerability model you picked, uh, but they vary between three and, and up to 9% of, of, of annual uh, copper might be disrupted on any given year, uh, simply because due to earthquakes. Okay, uh, so let me just quickly summarize um, this presentation. So there are a combination of, there is a combination of trends and issues that raise concerns regarding the reliability of supplies for certain non-fuel commodities. This is especially driven by the concentration of production in a few countries. Uh, we've developed an enhanced uh, methodology for assessing uh, which commodities pose the greatest risk using this uh, risk modeling framework. There is a federal strategy out there to help reduce that risk, and it's currently being implemented through the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So I'll stop there, and um, perhaps we can entertain a few questions. Thank you very much, Nadal, and um, uh, I think you've outlined and, and, you know, a, a, a host of things, and particularly the modeling that you all have been doing, and I've seen some questions already come in on that. Um, yeah, I, I, I go back to one of the things you emphasized and I think is one of the core ideas at the, at, the, at, the, at the basis of this webinar series, and that is emphasizing just exactly and in, in how profound the role of mineral commodities are for energy generally, as you just depicted, but also particular to the energy transition. So thank you for helping also support that public policy narrative and, and information that we're trying to foster both here at the Institute of the Americas and, of course, you know, at the Colorado School of Mine, Payne Institute. Um, let me let me throw something. I'm going to jump into some of the questions here, but just a real quick one. I always like to ask because this is for almost more for my edification than anything, and then we'll get into the real the, the tough questions. But define rare earths and explain in one or two sentences. Uh, so when I go to my next cocktail party, you know, whenever that may be down the road, or if I talk to somebody, I can say a rare earth and give me give me the the one sentence. Sure. So the rare earths are the lanthanides. So this is, let me see if I can, I don't know if I have a periodic table. Yes, I do. Uh, let's go here. So this is the lanthanide series. So lanthanum all the way through lutetium. And typically it includes also yttrium, right? So elements 57 through 71, but also element uh, 39. So yttrium and sometimes, but typically not, uh, scandium is sometimes included as well. So element 21. So is it fair to say we mix up sometimes the layman, the non-geologist, the idea of critical minerals and rare earths? They're distinctive. Yes. So rare earths are a specific set of elements. Uh, critical minerals is depending on whose definition, and there are several definitions out there, <laughs> of what is a critical mineral, which are the critical minerals, but they do not necessarily uh, equal each other. Typically, the rare earths are uh, almost always uh, on somebody's critical minerals list. Um, so that's, I think, where the confusion might come in. No, thank you. And I'm sure all the folks online who are very well versed in this are ready for me to move. So let, let's talk about the modeling because that's exactly, you know, I think the idea of what's critical and what's it mean for the economy in the U.S. Um, so from Kevin, does the risk model take into account technology developments, which could significantly alter demand? For example, the future commercializing of lithium sulfur batteries for electric vehicles as an alternative to lithium ion. Um, removing the need for cobalt, and obviously you you highlighted just how disruptive uh, cobalt could be, right? So talk about the risk model in terms of technology development. Sure. So that's a really good question, and I think one we get often. So in the modeling that we've done thus far, it is basically a snapshot in time of the year that we have the data for. So it's not necessarily looking at what future technology might look like. Um, so that's something that we we want to look at. Um, and we potentially could eventually incorporate. Uh, we typically what we do is we develop scenarios of what which technology might take up a certain per, a percentage of the market share and see what that might mean for demand and see where might production come from, and then circle that back into the risk modeling framework. But right now the model as it stands is currently uh, a retrospective to see um, you know what has happened in the recent past. Right. Uh, we feel that that's good enough for now because what we're really looking at is a window of about you know the next five to ten years our model probably can't tell us what's going to happen next year uh, but it, and it can't help really tell us what's going to happen in the next you know 10 or 20 years but we feel like if we look at the trends over time generally the commodities that are critical today haven't really changed too much so mm -hmm. we feel like we probably have a good insight of what we should worry about in the next five years or so
Super. Um, and so continuing along, along that, uh, there's a very specific question. What does VA and VA GDP refer to in the economic vulnerability function? Great question. So that uh, stands for value add. So that's basically the contribution to GDP. So what portion of GDP did that industry contribute? Okay. So obviously a key, a key definition, a key element to be to clarified. So I'm just going to go in order here, if that's okay. You know, I think we've got a bunch of people posing questions. Um, so let's jump to a North America question. And just for your uh, for your information, this has come up a lot in the previous webinars that we've done, um, particularly U.S.-Canada cooperation. And so people have routinely posed, well, what about Mexico? So could Mexico be added to the North America cooperation since a lot of U.S. companies are manufacturing goods that use the metals and rare metals from uh, – Mexico, which has some of those resources. So take take sort of the North America thought on that. Yeah, very really good question. So um, I'm obviously going to steer clear of any policy implications. At the USGS, we are strictly doing science. We don't do policy. Right, or right. Anything like that. Uh, we have collaborated uh, on a publication to look at North America as a trading block and see what uh, the net import reliance would be for North America versus the U.S. itself or Canada by itself or Mexico by itself. So that publication is out there, and I'm happy to send the link uh, around if, if folks are interested. Uh, but we did obviously include Mexico in that. And the picture does you know, show that the import reliance decreases significantly as you look at North America as a trading block rather than the U.S. alone. Right. So, I mean, I think the old, the, you know, the, the sort of central argument of, of, of economies of scale, regional integration, everything we've seen with NAFTA slash USMCA, you could extrapolate into a critical minerals uh, argument, I'm guessing, from what you're saying, but yes. without putting policy words in your mouth. <laughs> right. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of trade that goes across these two borders, right? Uh, there's a lot of, for example, tantalum that grows to Mexico and comes back several times. There's a lot of uh, the concentrate that, that gets shipped to refineries in, in, in Canada and comes back. So there's a lot of that trade going on. And if you do look at it as a trading block, the picture actually doesn't look so bad. Um, and you can include other countries as well, whether it's Australia or, or some of our uh, other friends out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is an important perspective to, to keep in mind. Right. And I think, you know, when you, you laid out the call to actions and you referenced the, you know, some of the things and we've obviously talked here about the energy resource governance initiative and how that can can play a role in there in terms of uh, fostering trade cooperation and best practices with like minded um, partners across the world. So right. um, before I get to China and there's there's a question here, uh, which I think is going to be a pretty entailed response. But let me let me throw something else on the table. Um, that I, I think has come up a lot. I haven't seen it yet today, but it's come up a lot and I think is relevant perhaps in relation to the, the question about technological advances. Um, we've talked or had a lot of questions in previous webinars about where recycling fits in. And, and obviously a lot of those questions previously were directed at lithium um, and, and, you know, lithium batteries and recycling. But so, so take maybe the broader recycling question vis-a-vis -vis critical minerals. And then if you want, um, whether it be lithium or, or others that are, you know, it seems to me cobalt is something of, of huge importance. So um, if you could handle or take on that question of recycling and help our conversation on that. Sure. So recycling is obviously very important and can play a significant role in decreasing, uh, diversifying supply and in turn decreasing the risk. Uh, it can also, especially if done in the United States or, you know, friendly countries, it decreases the risk for us even more. It is thus taken into account in the modeling in that sense. So we take a look at both primary production as well as domestic primary production as well as domestic recycling. And we try to take into account whenever the data are available, uh, the recycling uh, in, in the production concentration. So we're not just looking at primary production concentration. We're looking at total production concentration. So if uh, there is recycling of, of commodities in other countries. We take that into account to, to um, show how uh, supply is diversified. In general, a lot of the commodities that we care about, uh, there is very limited end of life recycling. And it's important mm -hmm. to make that distinction between uh, what's typically referred to as new scrap. So this is scrap that's produced at, at the manufacturers versus old scrap. So this is basically post-consumer or post-consumption scrap. Uh, a lot, for a lot of these commodities, there's little to no uh, currently, uh, post-consumer uh, recycling. So end-of-life recycling is, is almost negligible. In terms of cobalt, uh, it is, I think, value-added enough 
uh, that it will in batteries that it will get recycled. And I know there are several uh, companies out there that are well-known recyclers uh, that are uh, setting up operations to be able to recycle lithium ion batteries for their cobalt content. Um, so that it typically, it, it comes down to economics, right? Is it worthwhile to go after it? And a lot of times the problem is in collection, lack of collection. So uh, especially for electronics where a lot of these, you know, if you think about your iPhone having mm -hmm. a periodic table in there, uh, great, but you know, how much of that are you gonna recycle? Typically they're gonna go after the things that are value, you know, valuable, copper and gold uh, and any other precious metals that might be in there. The other things uh, typically are, are not gonna get recycled. Uh, it, even once they reach there. The problem is they typically don't reach recyclers because people either are um, holding on to them. I'm sure that a lot of us have uh, some old cell phones in the drawers or they, get, uh, you know, they, they simply get lost um, and, and never reach a, a proper recycler. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, you know, where where we see demand growth and maybe maybe this year things have been altered a little bit. But overall, with lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles and everyone was, I think, extrapolating from the, the sort of deployment level or number estimated of electric vehicles. And, well, what you know, how long can can that uh, last before we start to really need to deal with some kind of, like you said, disposal or better yet recycling? So I guess stay tuned. We'll continue to understand that. Thank you. Yeah, and and you know, for vehicles, they're they're pretty easy to keep track of. So vehicles typically don't get don't get lost. I mean, that's why we have something like 90, 95 percent recycling of lead acid batteries. Mm. And so you can imagine that as long as as the vehicles get returned and the batteries get recycled, uh, the if it's uh, if it's economic, they will recover, uh, particularly the cobalt. Yeah, well, I feel like on that question, whenever I have to replace my battery, I get some kind of surcharge or disposal okay. fee. <laughs> so speaking of public policies, um, let's talk about China and the, the time we have left. There's a couple different questions here. Let me, uh, there, the specific question from Richard, what is China's percent of equity stake with investments in Niobe, well, Niobium mining companies in Brazil and lithium production in Chile? Um, are are Chinese foreign direct investment uh, a threat, I guess is the question. Yeah. I think, uh, let me let me look up my notes. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I did, I knew somebody was going to ask that question, so I, I had it <laughs> written down here somewhere. Let me see if I can pull up my notes really quick. Um, sure, sure. Um, okay. So there's also, I think, um, well, I'll let you, before we jump ahead here. The question was specifically about um, Brazil. Um, okay. So my understanding is, and these numbers might have changed since I looked them up, but uh, there's several there are several mines in, in Brazil that produce niobium. Um, the the major one uh, operated by CBMM. There's 15% equity share by China Niobium Investment Holding Company. Um, the rest 70% is owned by a family, uh, and then there's 15% owned by a Japanese South Korean consortium. Uh, that mine alone, I think, accounts for something on the order of two-thirds of Brazil's Naomi production. Uh, a second operation, Catalao, uh, it's, uh, I think, 100% owned by China Mal China molybdenum. Mm. And that accounts for another 15 to 20% of, of Brazil's Naomi production. Is and there the any second, true Chile yeah. lithium? Um, I believe, uh, I'm not sure if it's the only one, but... Um, there is uh, SQM's, uh, the, that's the major um, lithium producer in Chile. I think something on the order of 23.8% is owned uh, by uh, Tianxi Lithium. Uh, so that's the Chinese company there. And, and so I guess then, you know, you've obviously modeled and you've laid out exactly some of what your modeling says over the last several years, but just broadly, anecdotally, Chinese foreign direct investment um, in terms of Africa and South, uh, South America, um, direct threat to supply disruption for the United States? I, I wouldn't say that. I think it's just uh, they're doing what they need to do to make sure that they have secure supplies. Um, mm -hmm. How does that actually play out in in real life scenarios in terms of um, you know any any situation where there might be a conflict or anything like that? It's difficult to say, but it's obvious that you know they know where they need uh, to secure their supplies, and and they're making sure that they have them. <laughs>
I'll editorialize and say that this sounds very much like the oil and gas sector going back a few years where when China soared in terms of domestic demand, outstripping supply, and they literally became the world's largest consumer, they went around Africa, the whole world and South America, and it was all about security of supply. And so locking up locking up access, whether it was in Venezuela or Brazil or Ecuador. So it sounds um, fairly similar in that regard. It's a matter of locking up security of, or security of supply and locking up resources. So um, let's see, We've, we're running out of time, but let's just finish here on, uh, uh, on a couple of questions. Um, beyond the geographical concentration of production, the concentration of processing refining operation for certain minerals also poses potential risk. What are the key barriers hampering investment in downstream value chains in importing countries? For example, rare earth processing outside China. So hopefully you can unwind that quickly. So the question, just if I understood it, so it's not, so the concentration, not just in mining, but also refining? Yeah, processing, refining, correct, yeah. Yeah, so that's obviously uh, often a bigger problem. Uh, and we try to model that whenever we have data. Um, so we do have a lot of that data, but not for not every commodity. But whenever we do have both mining and refining, we look again at the bottleneck stage that I mentioned for, for aluminum. We look at each of the stages and see where the bottleneck might occur. Okay. Um, so I'll just read to Jamil here, is, uh, his, and, and he's joined us, uh, I think, for all these. So thanks again for joining us today, Jamil. Uh, does it make economic sense to have domestic industry if the market is not that big, for example, in terms of imports? The estimated value of rare earth compounds and metals imported by the United States in 2019 was 170 million. Um, the only reason we import, import from China uh, alloy is because they are cost competitive. Can the U.S. provide rare earth at cost if they create co cooperation by end users? So hopefully you can understand that a little bit. I guess it's a matter of uh, the economics of it, which I think you've talked a little bit about, but if you don't want, if you could expand a little bit more. Yeah, so I guess yeah. the point is to say that, you know, we don't use a lot of um, rare earths, uh, which is true. I mean, the value of the rare earths is a relatively small market in the U.S. Uh, so can it be even competitive or should we even do it? Yeah. I think there are several things to note here. One is that perhaps direct consumption of rare earths are small, but there's the embedded trade that, that I think is, is, is typically missed. So we might be importing uh, finished goods like hard disk drives that contain rare earth magnets that we might not be accounting for. So there is there is a lot of rare earth consumption in the United States that's uh, embedded and we get it indirectly. Um, but in addition to just the, the pure economics of it, I think, that, uh, which I think we can make it work economically in the United States because we do have one of the highest, uh, you know, grade mines and mountain paths and, and, and several other deposits are, are quite good as well. Um, the question is, you know, uh, there, there are strategic reasons why you'd want to have a secure supply chain. Um, and so the rares, I think, fall in both camps. So just, I, I, we're out of time, but there is, a, I'll, I'll let Kevin jump in. We'll get the last question, Kevin. We'll wrap up with uh, continuing my, uh, my earlier question about recycling. Would changes to electric vehicle battery cycling um, that also recover lithium have a notable, notable effect on lithium risk? So the fact that lithium is not recovered? Uh, yeah, I guess so. If, 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 if there are changes that allow for a recovery of lithium, would that have a notable effect on lithium risk? From uh, I mean, obviously you've modeled it that assumes some of the, the current state of recycling, right? Yeah, I think generally uh, there's a lot of lithium out there. I mean, Australia had to pull back. Um, I think some of the other countries had to pull back as well, put some of their production that they expected back on care and maintenance simply because there was too much supply for demand that really didn't materialize. So I think, and, and generally the difficulty of, of recycling lithium, uh, I, I don't see it being a major issue uh, or a commodity that's gonna be recycled from lithium ion batteries in the short term. Uh, there's simply, the economics are not there and the technology is, is not there either. That's a very important point and we'll, we'll end there. I think that is a very nice uh, response to the question that's popped up a lot. And I think there's been a lot of, you know, the supposition of the potential of recycling lithium and what that would do. So we appreciate that very, uh, you know, uh, important point you just made. And I want to thank you for all your time. It's already uh, it's already the top of the hour again. And so uh, thank you so much, Nadal, for joining us and sharing your model and your your wonderful insights and also for for the information about your work with the Inter-American Development Bank. I think that that's something I'll look a little bit more. I had no idea. So thanks for the tip on that.
thank you all for joining us. Thanks to Jacqueline Sanchez for once again manning the, the webinar and everything coming off uh, without a hitch. Thank you, Morgan Bazillion and the Pain Institute. And finally, don't we're, the virtual events are not stopping anytime soon. We've got our annual conference that we've moved online. And so we'll be running that May 18th through 22nd. So uh, dial up our website and register for that. And thanks again, the doll. Best wishes, continued success, and uh, I, Thank you've you. got a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Be safe and healthy, as we say. <laughs>